So um, first, I'm going to briefly explain what a contact manifold is and what contact homology is supposed to be and why we have the question mark and stuff. So since it's a 15-minute talk, I'm kind of hiding a lot of details under the rug. And there'll be a lot of pictures, so it's kind of proof by picture, which is an interesting way to do analysis, but that's OK. <laughs> so um, there's been a couple other talks about contact manifolds, but since we've seen so many talks, I thought I'd just briefly review what a contact structure is. So this is a maximally non-integrable hyperplane distribution. And of course, if you're trying to rem remember the Frobenius theorem from differential geometry, I included a nice picture. And the Frobenius theorem would tell you you have a maximally non-integrable hyperplane distribution if you can never draw a co-dimension one um, submanifold whose tangent space is given by these hyperplanes. And so here, like, you can't draw a two-dimensional submanifold with tangent space given by these hyperplanes. And then, of course, it's kind of awkward to have this notion of a contact structure because there's not really a good way to like give you some maximally non-integrable hyperplane distribution. And it's kind of like a lot to say. And then also if I have some hyperplane distribution, how do I know it's maximally non-integrable? And so this is where um, a contact form comes into play. And you can define a contact, you can define any hyperplane distribution as a kernel of a one form. And then it turns out that this one form is actually a contact form, meaning it defines a contact structure if um, alpha wedge d alpha to the n minus 1 is a volume form, or alternatively and equivalently, d alpha restricted to c is non degenerate. And above, here we have alpha is dz minus y dx, so a really easy exercise is to do alpha wedge d alpha, and you get dx dy dz, which is everyone's favorite contact form in R3. Okay. So good, we understand what a contact form is. Okay, so now that we have a contact form associated to any contact form is a Rabe vector field. And I guess I briefly wanted to say something is that um, associated to a contact structure, you have many different one forms that will define the same contact structure as their kernel. Because if I take alpha and multiply it by anything positive, then I'm still going to have kernel of alpha is kernel of something positive times alpha is still C. And so in contact geometry, we have this trouble that really all we care about is this maximally non integral hyperplane distribution. But the only sort of tools we have to understand what's going on is after we pick a rabe, uh, is after we pick a contact form. Because after we pick a contact form, we have this rabe vector field that's uniquely determined by these two equations. So the first one, um, alpha of r is one, says it's a normalization condition for the rabe vector field. And the second one, saying that if we contract our alpha with d alpha and get zero, that the rabe vector field points in the unique null direction of d alpha. Okay, and uh, as a quick example, um, it turns out that Rabe orbits are hop fibers of S3. And here I wrote down the standard contact form in S3. And um, then some people have made very nice illustrations of what's going on. Um, so this is a picture of Patrick Mousseau. And so these purple lines um, are supposed to be the Rabe orbits. And then these fuchsia planes is supposed to be some set of the contact structures or some pieces of the contact structure. And then Niles Johnson made some really beautiful interactive magma things with the hub vibration. So if you're bored for the rest of the talk, you can go to his website and play around with his visualization. <laughs> um, and right, and so if you look at this like blue to purple, this blue to purple is like how it sketches out um, the orbits, which are the ray orbits. You can see that this kind of has some like complicated dynamics where everything is nested going on. And then we'll also revisit the hub vibration later to look at like a nice perturbation of it. So if you can keep these pictures in your mind, you should uh, do so. OK, so now I want to tell you a little bit about contact homology and what the dream for the chain complex is. So we're going to start by assuming that M is a compact manifold and alpha is non-degenerate. The non-degeneracy condition is kind of annoying to explain, but basically it's going to ensure that all of our ray orbits are isolated. Um, and so in lots of words, it says that yeah, if you, the periodic ones are isolated. And in, in lots of words, if you linearize the flow, of um, the Rabe vector field along an orbit and restrict it to the contact distribution, and then you look at what happens after time t, you're going to get some symplectic matrix, and you don't want to have one as an eigenvalue, and then you'll know that the flow is non degenerate. But that's kind of hard to understand if you've never seen it before. OK, so the idea is to do Morse theory on this action functional, except we're not really going to be doing Morse theory. It's just sort of like the jumping point. Um, and so the idea is that if we write down this action functional, you can check that the only critical points of this action functional are going to be um, closed Rabe orbits associated to alpha. And so this is kind of like why you might want to try to do Morse theory. Um, and then the grading on the orbits, you can't compute the number of um, negative, or the number of negative, eig or sorry, right, you can't compute the number of negative eigenvalues associated to this Hessian because it's going to have an infinite number. And so we have something called the conley zander index which associates, um, it's like a winding number for arcs of symplectic matrices. 
Um, and I'm not going to go into more detail about that. And then it turns out that the C star, which is going to end up trying to be our chain group, is going to be all the closed non-degenerate rabe orbits, and then we're going to have to throw out bad rabe orbits. And this was like sort of, uh, people came up with this really bizarre terminology, but basically rabe orbits are said to be bad if when you iterate them, their Conley Zander index doesn't um, stay always even or always odd, it changes parity. And so you throw out all of the odd multiples of, of the rabe orbits whose Conley Zander index changes parity under iteration. Um, so then the gradient flow lines is not really going to work in this situation. And we're going to use finite energy pseudo-holomorphic cylinders. And Helm is probably going to be angry that this is what I'm calling finite energy pseudo-holomorphic cylinders. But um, if you use Stokes' theorem, it's basically the same thing. And so um, you're going to have to only care about things up to equivalence class. We're going to use this like nice M as a moduli space. Here gamma plus and gamma minus are rabe orbits of period T plus or minus. And pseudo-holomorphic means that we're going to have maps from cylinders into R cross M, which turns out to be a symplectic manifold, um, satisfying the Debar equation, which I've written down. And then this finite energy thing is basically akin to an um, asymptotic condition. And so we want basically the ends of these cylinders um, to be limiting on closed periodic orbits in the M direction and going off to plus or minus infinity in the R direction. So I wrote down some equations. You don't really have to look at them if you don't want to. And this will all be done up to reparameterization because there's a question of when do I sort of start and end a rabe orbit? Like it doesn't really matter at what point I start it and I have like a whole S1's worth of places where I can put my starting point. And as long as I come back to that starting point, I'll be closed. So we're going to have to model by reparameterization, um, which I won't really explain that much. And then the differential is going to be a weighted count of pseudo-holomorphic cylinders up to reparameterization. And already in Morse theory, the analogy starts to kind of break, because not only do we have these crazy pseudo-holomorphic things running around, we're doing some weighted count of, um, of rabe orbits and pseudo-holomorphic curves and in interpolating between them. And so that's going to mean that like, we don't really have a manifold that we're working with. And then at the end of the day, we hope that this is independent of all the choices we made along the day, uh, made. And so this includes like the choice of the complex structure J twiddle and the choice of our reparameterizations <laughs> and um, like, there's something else that, oh, and also the choice of the contact form that gives us the rape vector field. And so this is a very celebrated paper by Elie Ashberg, Gimenthal, and Hofer, where they sketch what symplectic field theory is supposed to be. <laughs> so it's a conjecture that has also been used as a theorem. <laughs> well, some people have used it as a theorem. Well, I mean, it says theorem in your paper. Well, but it, there's a big disclaimer at the beginning that you don't say anything. But there's lots of people that didn't read the disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> you buried it in like a hundred page paper as one <laughs> sentence. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so and then it says assume a minimal amount of things. What? That's why there's, well, okay, so we'll get to the. One of many, many what? Statements. <laughs> <laughs> like in the whole world or like no, no, about simple? Simplic like well, this is a like series of three propositions. They're not even important enough to be a theorem. <laughs> um, the status is as complicated and like I have a, <laughs> <laughs> so I have a ghetto workaround that's like on the next slide. Um, but it, my workaround does not involve assuming a minimal amount of things. It's more like assuming a maximal but happily non empty amount of things. <laughs> right, so then at the end of the day, you want to say that this chain complex, that this thing is a chain complex and the homology that you compute is actually independent of alpha and J twiddle. And like back in this paper, they didn't have this notion of like bad rabe orbits, and Michael Hutchings came along and said, oh, you have to exclude bad rabe orbits, but no one wrote this up, and so the state, or the state of literature is very murky because there's a lot of people running around saying that these are actual proofs, but then there's holes in them and they don't explain when the holes come and arise, and so it's, it's a big mess to try to go through. So sadly, I think this 15-minute talk will be like the most comprehensive overview of the subject that you'll get. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so then <laughs> we had this like beautiful dream with Morse theory, but then it turns into something that's like not really so awesome. And the reason why it's not so awesome is that you allow for multiply covered rabe orbits to generate your chain complex. And in Hamiltonian floor homology, which still has lots of problems, has less problems because you only allow for um, 
periods of time one. And here we allow for periods of like any multiple that we want. And so that means we're gonna have multiply covered pseudo-holomorphic curves running around and you still have to treat transversality for them and that's like, you have a lot of fun doing that as Helmut has learned in the past 14 years. <laughs> but you're still having fun. And then as a result, if we don't have any transversality results, this like nice little moduli space I wrote down, it's like unclear if it's more than a collection of letters or what's going on. And since we don't know if it's more than a letter right now, we can't say it's a manifold or an orbifold. What? Um. <laughs> it's just a literal interpretation of. Right, so as a result, this letter can have non-positive virtual dimension. <laughs> and so, in the usual story, if you have some sort of transversality, you can say, oh, after generic choice of J, or after I like do some awesome perturbation, or assume some non-degeneracy of something, that uh, this thing that I ended up having has at least dimension of the space of automorphisms that act on the um, target. And so the target in this case is R cross M, and so the dimension of automorphisms on R cross M is the dimension of R, which is one, but since we don't have transversality, we can't like ensure that these moduli spaces have um, positive virtual dimension. Okay, and that's gonna be hard once we also remember that compactness issues are severe. So Bourgeois, Eliasberg, Hofer, Vizetsky, and Zander have a like 120 page paper about compactness and you can have really crazy things happening when you try to compactify um, this moduli space. And so this is going to sort of destroy our dream coming from Morse theory. So in Morse theory, if you assume that you start with a Morse male function, you would have like a, a gradient flow line going from X to Z where the index difference between X and Z is two. It could only break off into two index difference one things. So here's supposed to be like an index different one cylinder and another index difference one cylinder. So this is exactly the picture with Morse theory except they have cylinders instead of, tra of uh, trajectories. So the problem is that <laughs> if we are working with cylindrical contact homology, these cylinders can develop minimum, and then when you try to compactify it, it, just, it doesn't turn into just a broken cylinder. It can turn into like a pair of pants, you cap it off by a disc, and you have another cylinder, and then you can allow for even more complicated buildings, and the only requirement you have is that the index of all of these pieces has to add to two. And of course, if you allow for non-positive things, then there's gonna be many more ways to add to two, and that becomes difficult, and so you can't exclude these sorts of things from happening. But if everything is gonna be positive, then basically the only way you could have an index difference two thing break is to into two index difference one cylinders, and maybe like a trivial cylinder, but we'll ignore that for the, the time being. So right, so the whole story is that the nightmare is that adding to two is hard. Okay. So the hope is that um, some people, like Wendell, Hutchings, and Taubes, and I realized I didn't like alphabetize that at all, but it's not to say that some people are more important than others, um, have really nice automatic transversality results in dimension three, and uh, if you understand basic arithmetic and how the conley zander index works, you can appeal to them. But of course, um, it's like not really awesome if you abstractly understand arithmetic and the conley zander index because you still have to come up with a perturbation of a contact form whose ray orbits satisfy these basic properties of arithmetic and the conley zander index um, that you would need in order to appeal these automatic transversality results. And so then you realize that this like original awesome thesis project you had uh, was not actually like completely crap and you can plot a nice perturbation from it. And so this perturbation comes from pre wandization spaces. And so I drew like a lens space, L32 on the right hand side. Um, and if you put the height function, you have two critical points. And over the critical points, you'll have basically a Hupf fiber still remaining as a ray orbit. And it turns out that um, you can compute the conley zander indices really nicely. And it allows you to come up with something called dynamically separated. So if we assume that the first churn class is zero, of the contact distribution, it means that we can find a complex volume form. We can use that to compute the conley zander indices and get a well-defined integral grading on them. Um, and today, we'll just restrict to when we only have contractible orbits so that this definition does not become more complicated. But basically, the first thing you want to assume is that the simple contractible rave orbits um, are always between three and five for their conley zander indices. And by simple rave orbit, I mean like that's, you only went around the rave orbit once. You didn't like go around it multiple times. And then the second condition you need is that every time you do go around the ray orbit, you increase the Conley-Zander index by four. 
And so this is like a pretty uh, hard condition to satisfy because things like the ellipsoid don't satisfy this. Um, and so basically the only things that are going to satisfy it are like going to be pre-quantization spaces and like um, pre-quantization spaces over like orbifolds. So just have conditions that you can really use the ellipse as a Right. Right, because you're basically perturbing the contact form. And so in my thesis, I was able to say if we assume this, then the chain complex, or then the thing that I wrote down is actually a chain complex. Um, I didn't get around to proving invariance in my thesis, but I did recently discover that Hutchings has some nice results that allow me to get invariance under choices of dynamically separated contact forms down. So that's like, so f that's what's going on so far. But this dynamically separated condition is no way generic, and so it's not really like that awesome. But the hope for contact homology is that um, you write down some sort of homological invariance of the contact structure, which would be nice because there's all these different contact forms running around that can define the same contact structure. And then you could say something qualitative about the Rabe dynamics associated to um, a given contact structure without writing down a contact form. Okay, so then I will very quickly say something about the links of the simple singularities. As far as, I mean, but you think it's false. I think it's false. And then, um, so I'll really briefly say something about the links of the simple singularities since they have some interesting dynamical properties. Um, so these appear as the origin of C2 mod gamma. Here, gamma is a finite subgroup of SU2C, and the origin is an isolated quotient singularity. And this variety can be identified with a hypersurface um, sitting inside of C3. And the reason for this is that if you write down um, the um, monomials in two complex variables, there's always three monomials that are invariant under the action of gamma, and there's always one relation that um, between these monomials, and this relation is actually F sub gamma equals zero, and so if you take the preimage of zero, you end up with the hypersurface. And then you can look at the link of a singularity, which is gonna be S5 intersected with this hypersurface, and it turns out that has a contact structure, and um, you can also think about sort of the link as a different thing as being S3 mod gamma and the context structure on S3 descends to S3 mod gamma and this contact form descends to S3 mod gamma as well. Okay. And then this is sort of like a stupid lemma, but um, these two objects are actually contactomorphic. So I think Milner originally proved that these S3 mod gamma and L are homeomorphic and then we know that three manifolds are diffeomorphic, but um, just knowing that three manifolds are diffeomorphic doesn't help you with them being contactomorphic, so you have to do a little bit more to get that they're contactomorphic. And now the question is that, um, so back in the day, people used topology of links to tell you a lot about the nature of singularities. They used them to come up with exotic spheres, and uh, people would like to use them to come up with different, like instead of having exotic spheres, you have sort of exotic contact structures, which are not the same as those on um, S2 on minus one. And so that would say that somehow singularities might have some dynamical implications for contact manifolds. Okay. And um, the really nice dynamical relationship that you have is that if you have a pre-quantization like the Hopf vibration, so here H over from S3 to S2 is the Hopf vibration and then capital H, my notation is not awesome, is a Hamiltonian, and actually we're gonna just pick capital H to be a more small function. It turns out that if you take alpha prime to be one plus a small lift of the Hamiltonian function times the original degenerate contact form on S3, um, that you can write down the perturbed rave dynamics in a really way, so it'll be the original rave dynamics which are basically um, giving you the fibers of the Hopf vibration plus some small lift of um, a vector field of the Hamiltonian vector field sitting on S2. And then you also know that XH is J0 times the gradient of H, and so you can use the symmetry of gamma to pick H. And so in the case where we have gamma is the binary tetrahedral group, that's a simple singularity of E6 type, you can take H equal to XYZ. And then the reason why you can sort of pick H um, using the symmetry of gamma is that there's a map from spin three to SO3, and SO3 are the point rotation groups um, and in three dimensions, and so you just wanna pick some, so T star, the binary tetrahedral group, descends to just the regular tetrahedral group, and so you want the gradient of H to basically be invariant underneath the action of um, the tetrahedron, and so you want, you want critical points of H to appear at the vertices and the midpoints of your edges and the centers of your faces, and then, um, the gradient flow lines in a usual way, and then it turns out that you can write XH like this, and the really nice thing is that if you use this to 
um, try to compute contact homology, you're actually going to end up with a chain complex that corresponds to the presentation of S3 mod gamma as a ciphered fiber space. So then that made me think that um, there should be some relationship between um, contact dynamics and um, topology, since you can realize ray orbits sort of in terms of uh, expressions of ciphered fiber spaces. And so um, the things that I'm other that I'm thinking about are other ciphered fiber spaces and string homology and um, the understanding the relationship with symplectic homology, and then there's also foundational work, which is trying to do things in more general reality in dimension three, looking at dimensions bigger than three, and other dynamical questions involving contact structures. Thank you very much.